Chapter Twelve of Anna Karenina, Book Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Constance Garnett, Book Two, Chapter Twelve. In the early days after his return from Moscow, whenever Levin shuddered and grew red. Remembering the disgrace of his rejection, he said to himself, This was just how I used to shudder and blush, thinking myself utterly lost, when I was plucked in physics and did not get my remove, and how I thought myself utterly ruined after I had mismanaged that affair of my sister's that she entrusted to me. And yet, now that years have passed, I recall it and wonder that it could distress me so much. It will be the same thing, too, with this trouble." Time will go by, and I shall not mind about this either. But three months had passed, and he had not left off minding about it. And it was as painful for him to think of it as it had been those first days. He could not be at peace, because, after dreaming so long of family life, and feeling himself so ripe for it, he was still not married, and was further than ever from marriage. He was painfully conscious himself, as were all about him, that at his years it is not well for men to be alone. He remembered how, before starting for Moscow, he had once said to his cowman, Nikolai, a simple-hearted peasant, whom he liked talking to, "'Well, Nikolai, I mean to be married,' and how Nikolai had promptly answered, as of a matter on which there could be no possible doubt. "'And high time, too, Konstantin Dmitrievich. But marriage had now become further off than ever. The place was taken and whenever he tried to imagine any of the girls he knew in that place, he felt that it was utterly impossible. Moreover, the recollection of that rejection and the part he had played in the affair tortured him with shame. However often he told himself that he was in no wise to blame in it, that recollection, like other humiliating reminiscences of a similar kind, made him twinge and blush. There had been in his past, as in every man's, actions recognized by him as bad, for which his conscience ought to have tormented him. But the memory of these actions made him so much suffering as those trivial but humiliating reminiscences. These wounds never healed, and with these memories was now arranged his rejection and the pitiful position in which he must have appeared to others that evening. But time and work did their part. Bitter memories were more and more covered up by the incidents, paltry in his eyes, but really important, of his country life. Every week he thought less often of Kitty. He was patiently looking forward to the news that she was married, or just going to be married, hoping that such news would, like having a tooth out, completely cure him. Meanwhile spring came on, beautiful and kindly, without the delays and treacheries of spring, one of those rare springs in which plants, beasts, and man rejoice alike. This lovely spring roused Levin still more, and strengthened him in his resolution of renouncing all his past, and building up his lonely life firmly and independently. Though many of the plans with which he had returned to the country had not been carried out, still the most important resolution, that of purity, had been kept by him. He was free from that shame which had usually harassed him after a fall, and he could look everyone straight in the face. In February he had received a letter from Maria Nikolaevna, telling him that his brother Nikolai's health was getting worse, but that he would not take advice, and in consequence of this letter Levin went to Moscow to his brothers, and succeeded in persuading him to see a doctor, and to go to a watering place abroad. He succeeded so well in persuading his brother, and in lending him money for the journey without irritating him, that he was satisfied with himself in the matter. In addition to his farming, which called for special attention in the spring, and in addition to reading, Levin had begun that winter a work on agriculture, the plan of which turned on taking into account the character of the laborer on the land as one of the unalterable data of the question, like the climate and the soil and consequently deducing all the principles of scientific culture, not simply from the data of soil and climate, but from the data of soil, climate, and a certain unalterable character of the laborer. Thus, in spite of his solitude, 
or in consequence of his solitude. His life was exceedingly full. Only rarely he suffered from an unsatisfied desire to communicate his stray ideas to someone besides Agafea Mihalovna. With her, indeed, he did not infrequently fell into discussion upon physics, the theory of agriculture, and especially philosophy. Philosophy was Agafea Mihalovna's favorite subject. Spring was slow in unfolding. For the last few weeks it had been steadily fine, frosty weather. In the daytime it thawed in the sun, but at night there were even seven degrees of frost. There was such a frozen surface on the snow that they drove the wagons anywhere off the roads. Easter came in the snow. Then, all of a sudden, on Easter Monday, a warm wind sprang up, storm clouds swooped down, and for three days and three nights the warm driving rain fell in streams. On Thursday the wind drooped, and a thick gray fog brooded over the land as though hiding the mysteries of the transformations that were being wrought in nature. Behind the fog there was the flowing of water, the cracking and floating of ice, the swift rush of turbid, foaming torrents. And on the following Monday in the evening, the fog parted, the storm clouds split up into little curling crests of cloud, the sky cleared, and the real spring had come. In the morning the sun rose brilliant and quickly wore away the thin layer of ice that covered the water and all the warm air was quivering with the steam that rose up from the quickened earth. The old grass looked greener, and the young grass thrust up its tiny blades. The buds of the gelder rose, and of the currant and the sticky birch buds were swollen with sap, and an exploring bee was humming about the golden blossoms that studded the willow. Larks trilled unseen above the velvety green fields and the ice-covered stubble land. Peewits wailed over the lowlands and marshes flooded by the pools. Cranes and wild geese flew high across the sky, uttering their spring calls. The cattle, bald in patches where the new hair had not grown yet, lowed in the pastures. The bow-legged lambs frisked round their bleeding mothers. Nimble children ran about the drying paths, covered with the prints of bare feet. There was a merry chatter of peasant women over their linen at the pond, and the ring of axes in the yard, where the peasants were repairing plows and harrows. The real spring had come. End of chapter 12 Recording by Sarah Jane Zweer, Ponce Savant Laos